Please forgive me if I do not repeat all of the wonderful titles of everybody who is here and let me just say good evening, friends. And there are truly many in this audience who are friends, many of very long standing. And I must tell you that I am so privileged to be here on the occasion of the, a lecture honoring the memory of our colleague and friend, Dennis Pantin. And I do hope, actually, I would like to say that I expect that this would be just the initiation of a series of open lectures uh, named for Dennis just how we have such a series for Arthur Lewis um, and many, many other um, not notables. I would hope that the Department of Economics would host such a series, but actually, and I think you will understand from what I'm going to say here this evening, I think it might be more suitable for the Faculty of Social Sciences to honor, to host such a series. Because Dennis was an economist, a model economist, but his approach was so um, creative and so important because it went beyond the boundaries of the discipline of economics. Precisely, in the sense that in everything that he wrote and in his work, it was very clear that he, as an economist, was um, explaining events or advocating um, policies for society. There was an intimate understanding there that really the purpose of this discipline is to serve society. Um, and um, I would like to, to tell you that I, I have come to the conclusion from reading a great deal of Dennis's work, of, of course from knowing him and respecting him and loving him like all of us who knew him well do, that Dennis has made is a path-breaking Caribbean economist. This does not take away from many others who have served, who have taught the economics departments, but I believe that he is in a way, uh, in our time, continuing a tradition which was strongest actually in the 1960s. And the reason was because that was a period where the political independence of Trinidad, Jamaica, um, Jamaica Barbados, Guyana, those four important countries of the English-speaking Caribbean opened the prospects of following political independence with economic independence with control of the people over their futures and their economies and their societies. And it was a period in which the, that, that gave rise to extraordinary Caribbean economists, some of whom were mentioned by, um, um, by Mar Marlene uh, in her introduction and by others, um, including William Dimas, um, Alistair McIntyre. I think actually in Trinidad at that time, I, I must mention um, Frank Rampersad also, uh, the early writings of the, um, the, the 60s. And then there was that whole group of West Indian economists from the Mona campus, uh, who were engaged in the studies commissioned by the then federal government, uh, uh, of which the lead study, of course, 
was by um, Fred Thomas and Harold Brewster on dynamics of West Indian integration. But there were a number of other studies were done by uh, by Beckford and Gurdon and De Castro and uh, and who and who. Um, then um, and then there was Lloyd Best also in the in the sixties with the uh, foundation of the New World Movement, which arose actually out of his engagement by uh, Chetty Jagan to participate in economic an economic plan for Guyana, and his uh, conclusions that he uh, thought that it was necessary to have a, a, a view of this plan that was more homemade, that was more based in the characteristics of this region, that was less of a copy of whatever was being done um, in Europe. Uh, and then the publication of Lloyd's um, article in 1968, that is generally taken to be the uh, initial move in what became known as our work on plantation economy. Um, all of these people I mentioned, including it comes to mind that Alistair McIntyre was quite important in the, in the 70s as one of the architects of the, um, of the Bauxite Derby, of the decision by the government of Jamaica to increase revenue from bauxite by um, developing a levy that was based on the price of aluminium. But in but whereas there was this um, this explosion, if you like, of independent thinking and economics in the sixties, in the seventies, I think um, there was less writing. Uh, less new ideas coming forward, but of course there was there was a lot a lot that was happening both in Trinidad in the 70s and in in Jamaica. Dennis um, graduated from th this university in 1973. Uh, and then, um, like many others, went to work for the Ministry of Planning and Development. Uh, and, uh, and then went to do his graduate studies in England. Now, the fact that Dennis chose uh, to go to the, in, to the IDS, International Development um, Studies Program, at the University of Sussex, I think was very important in his intellectual development because that was, first of all, it was a program that was centered on development. Development, principally development, economic development. It was created by the late Dundee Sears, who had a great familiarity with this region um, and who wrote very important article in 1964 called The Mechanisms of the Open Petroleum Economy. Uh, actually, this article in some ways was based on his previous experience in Venezuela where he was working with, um, with people from Economic Commission, the SEPA, United Nations uh, Economic Commission for Latin America and where he had not noted that petroleum economies, whether the Venezuelan one or the Trinidad uh, petroleum economy, had certain characteristics. And one of them, one of them, which Dennis of course also noted, and it is a very important one, is that the um, the, the data, the figures in which we, me we measure economic progress, which is usually gross national product, or we measure gross national product per capita. In the case of petroleum economies, do not tell you anything very much about how 
people are actually living in those economies. Uh, they are numbers, they're important numbers, but they uh, can very easily and very often do at the same time coexist with high rates of unemployment and, 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 and poverty. Um, I do not know and I would really like to have asked Dennis why he chose to go to study um, and not at the LSE and not in Oxford or Cambridge like so many of the others uh, but at Sussex with, uh, with uh, Sears but the, he also did his thesis on that same subject but interestingly it had a little twist to it because the name of the thesis was depletion in the petroleum, open petroleum economy case of Trinidad and Tobago. And when we come to depletion, that you are in the area of the economics of natural resources. And it raises already the question about if you have a country with natural resources, in this case petroleum, uh, this will not last forever and so perhaps from the beginning of the exploitation of this resource some provision should be made for the event of the depletion of the resource. So the, 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 the interest, the concern, the subject if you like of the economics of a country depending on natural resources, was there in the work of Dennis from the time he came back from England, from the time he started as a lecturer at UE here in 1990. Um, I am happy that so much of the, uh, so many facts about his professional life have been dealt with and I don't have to repeat. But I would like to tell you that I thought it was quite amazing how, with so much teaching, with so many articles he wrote, he also was able to, um, to, to be a prime mover in the establishment of institutions such as the Trinidad and Tobago Association of Economists, uh, which put out that excellent journal called Assets, of which he was an editor for very many years. The Association of Caribbean Economists, founded in 1987 in Jamaica, of which Dennis was the vice president for the English-speaking countries for a whole number of years. And of course, the endless concerns of for constitutional reform and I will come to that in a moment. So it is in addition to the teaching and the writing, including that book which was earlier mentioned, which is really a, a, a jewel of a little textbook on environmental economics, uh, there were the, the engagement and of course, last but not least, there were the innumerable articles published in The Guardian or the Express, or both, but co constant comment uh, with the, on public affairs. Um, I, I would like to say to, I, I may say that I read a lot of Dennis' work because I don't think that I'm breaking any confidence if I tell you that I was uh, one of the referees who was asked their opinion on his work when he was, uh, when it was decided to, uh, to make him a professor. But, and then more recently, I try, again, I went back to read some more, and I am simply immensely impressed. I, do, I believe that Dennis Pandan, as an economist, as a career, Caribbean economist, has been grossly underappreciated. Uh, and I am, um, how do I know? But I do believe that his life had not tragically ended so soon. 
he would have emerged as a leading and important figure in public discourse, not only in this country, but throughout this whole region. Because Dennis had a perspective on the problems that, with all due respect to many others, simply was a wider and larger and deeper one. Interestingly, he spoke many times and wrote uh, concerning his idea of how economics should be taught, teaching of economics. And in those comments, he insisted on the fact that not only economists, economic students, uh, but all social science students, and indeed not only social science students, should be exposed to a course on the philosophy of knowledge. The philosophy of knowledge which deals with how ideas, where ideas come from, where theories come from, it is a branch of philosophy. I will confess that I don't know very much about it. I think I'm pretty much the same as very many others who have uh, been trained in social sciences uh, without, without exposure, really, to the broader approach, which was clearly very important to Dennis, and he thought that all students should be made familiar, really, with the philosophy of, of knowledge. Um, Beyond that, he then stated that he thought that teaching should be able to explain the development in the economy, but we should have that explanation not exclusively in terms of neoclassical economics, which is the main, main the bread and butter, if you wish, of teaching these days, but in terms of many other approaches. And uh, to that I would very, very strongly add my uh, concurrence. I believe myself that economics should be taught the way that it was taught to me at the London School of Economics very, very many years ago by the late Nicholas Caldor. It's a name that some of you hopefully uh, will recognize who taught the course on e economic analysis as a course in the history of economic thought. So you bring on the, the founder, Adam Smith, and explain what was his problem, what was the problematic, what was he writing about, what was his method, value, distribution, and so on. And then, uh, and then the, you bring the, the next person, but it is Ricardo, and after that it is Marx, and then it is etc. Uh, explain the problems which these different thinkers addressed, uh, and, uh, and then ask the question whether what the problems they addressed and the way in which they saw economics has a relevance to our problems today. Well, that was his approach to teaching. I don't know myself, I do not know any economics department that I know of uh, that, uh, that, um, that, that, that has an approach even beginning to approximate that um, perspective. But perhaps in the future it will come. Now I want to suggest to you that the reason I think that Dennis Pandan is a path-breaking Caribbean economist, that I believe that time will tell, uh, the, I believe the judgment of, of, uh, of later economists will be that he, he was standing far above and beyond the mainstream, so to speak. And let me suggest particularly two or three of his writings. 
I think the first one I'd have to would have to be that little book he wrote in the late 1980s on uh, Into the Valley of Debt. No, I, many of you may be familiar with the circumstances. We are now in the 80s. There has been declining GDP as the oil um, boom basically came to an end at the beginning of the 80s. If you remember, 1982 was also the year in which Mexico announced that they could not um, service their debt and uh, the oil, uh, international oil boom was uh, over for a number of years. Um, there was in the, a, a decline in this figure, the GDP and market value, it actually um, uh, came down in half. I remember that over that line of years. But just as when GDP increases in an oil economy, it doesn't really mean that the actual living conditions of the most people get that much better. And then when, when that figure comes down, it doesn't really mean that conditions of people actually in the economy uh, are, are, have declined by, by 50%, that is not so. What it meant in the oil boom, what was so clear was that the, that the success of the hydrocarbon sector um, crowded out um, at economic activities which were previously much more important, particularly agriculture, food production, um, and, and, and some other local manufacturers. I remember very well that uh, in 1988, 89, I think it was around 88, when uh, this country had accumulated a whole bunching up, a crowding up uh, of, um, of payments due on, uh, on debt, on money borrowed, many of them for the uh, Point Lisa's projects. Uh, but the, the question was whether the, the, <coughs> the situation was that the foreign exchange reserves were very low, that they were projected to go negative. Uh, the question was, should the country go to the IMF to get a loan? Uh, I must say that at that time, uh, I was of the opinion, although I was very, very critical and aware of IMF, that the circumstances were such that this was the best course. But Dennis was of the other opinion and expressed it in that book, um, Into the Value of Debt, which I have just recently reread. And I must say that I would say that that, that that statement, that book, is absolutely brilliant. It is explained in simple terms for anybody to understand the argument he sets out for what he calls um, sacrifice. He take the sacrifice rather, rather than the suffering of the uh, going the route of the fund. He, with reference to the experience of Jamaica, he made a very strong case and warning uh, of where we should not go, why we should not uh, go to the fund, even though it was admitted that the circumstances were very difficult. Um, I, I think it was simply an exemplary uh, text uh, which any interested person could understand. They did not have to have any degree in economics. So, at that time, I may say that youth unemployment was very high. It was about 35%, 30 or 40%. Uh, the conditions were bad. The country was indeed on the 
verge of some social upheaval. You remember this was a, a year or two before the coup of 1990, which of course nobody could could for could for, for ten. But um, what happened? Of course, Dennis used to like to tell me that God must have been a Trinidadian because mm -hmm. the country was so damn lucky. Well, that was luck. What brought the country out of that situation was really the fortune of the gas boom that, from the 90s and from then on, all the 90s. Um, but the, the, the issue, I'm coming back to the issue of the difficulties of assisting of the difficulties of the non-oil sector. It's been a, a constant problem throughout the 1980s and the 1990s, and uh, the non-oil sector has a great, is being crowded out, has great difficulties. Uh, because of course it is quite obvious that the answer to the inevitable depletion of the resource is to provide for alternative activity. And here we come to what I think is one of Dennis's really very important contributions. And it is his um, theory, his statement, his position, first uh, developed in, I think, the mid-90s, that what we have here is a, a rent, a rentier economy, and a rentier state, and a and rentier society. What does this mean? It, re it means that we, we have a situation and in the extreme. So this, this is so for all economists dependent on natural resources, whether they are depleted, depletable or not. In other words, um, minerals and petroleum, but also agriculture and um, uh, agriculture or um, the tourism based on natural resources. The, the, um, the proceeds of, the, if you wish, let us say, the contribution of nature, the contribution of nature, which comes as the proceeds from the exploitation of the natural resources, generates um, revenue for the state. The, and the state passes on that revenue to the rest of society in various ways, all, all kinds of ways. This is a different political and social process from a, an economy that is based with, with no natural resources, that is based on economic activity of firms, whether they are private or state firms, it really doesn't matter, where the, if the wealth is created, so to speak, in industry, in economic activity, and the state um, taps into that in the form of taxation for a certain um, a, a certain social uh, product that goes to the state for various purposes of the state. What we have when a very large amount of the income flow passes to the state, uh, when you have in in our in the petroleum economy case. You, you have a kind of reversal of the power situation between the state uh, and the private sector and the rest of the society. And it then, it then depends, the, the, the way in which people and society benefits 
from the income which derives in this manner is very directly dependent on the way in which that state is managed. And this is not just the regular situation of the relation between business and government, but this is the situation of a rente economy, meaning that the income that derives from the natural resource, which should, belongs in a sense to the entire population because the people own the natural resource, but, but it, is, it, it, it comes through the state. Now this raises then the question of the political process whereby the governments are, how governments are formed. It takes us directly to Dennis's concerning interest in constitutional reform. In constitutional reform because of the role which the state plays in a rente economy particularly uh, and the power which accrues to those men and women, uh, mostly men, but neither here nor there, who control the state. So we come now to questioning whether the kind of political model that we have here, the same as we have in Canada, that derives from, uh, from Britain, developed in Britain and no doubt it works in Britain, but it has also become the political model of very many um, former colonies, countries under the, in the Commonwealth. And there are, this is not the first time or the first occasion in which it has been questioned whether this particular political model is suitable. Dennis developed the argument and quite early in, the, in his writings, actually in the 1980s, that same book about Into the Valley of Debt, that, that the system really is not functional. And that what, in his opinion, at that time he favored would be more in the direction of the American system, an election of uh, a president or prime minister, he said it would be nice to call that person a chief servant, in the tradition of revival, but, um, but that the, the then this elected top official uh, should be able to surround him or herself with the most competent people who are competent to manage, so to speak, the, the economy and, and the society and uh, all the rental in, rent, rent income that flows uh, through the state, uh, that then there should, has to be checks and balances and reforms of those people who are elected uh, without going into details and also a proposal which has been around for a very long time. I remember Lloyd Best talking about this in the, I think in the 70s, uh, of a Senate that would, is not, not of the kind that uh, we, we have that is uh, partly elected but that is a representative of the, all the major interest groups uh, representing uh, the society of all the communities, um, business, uh, labor, ed education, uh, etc. So this idea of constitutional reform uh, just won't go away. I may say that when, of all the time that I spent in Jamaica, I became profoundly convinced that the Westminster system is the worst kind of political system to have in that country because it really, it really divides the population into two tribes belonging to two parties 
and uh, it's first past the post, it's all either one party wins and then they're in, and then the other one, and then uh, that one is out, and it, it is divisive uh, in a country which is divided um, ethnically or racially in some way, of course it has also obvious disadvantages. But the, the, the reason I'm mentioning this is, is that for Dennis, he could see and not only understand, but then go to share that understanding with the public in his columns, in his activities, that the answer to many of our problems does not lie with economics. It is the, the, the solutions are not to be found in the discipline of economics. Solutions are to be found in the wider area of the relationship between uh, the economy, uh, the political institutions, and beyond that, of course, also cultural uh, aspects of, of the understanding of the population. Um, so I, I believe for the understanding that we are here dealing with the Ramti economy, but also a Ramti state, and the Ramti society in many ways, the, therefore there is not really very much incentive to engage in productive activity. Um, there is a disconnect between work and reward problems. Um, now there was another topic I had wanted to talk about. Oh yes, of course, the environment. Uh, and the, the, um, the, the really very imaginative idea uh, that was put forward in the Arthur Lewis lecture, that small, islands, Caribbean islands, could lead the way to a different, a different way of life, a different, a, a, a different way of arranging our relationship with the natural environment and with each other um, that is based on what he calls Econologism? Econologism. Is, oh, is that right? Econ Econologism. I find it hard to get my tongue around this word. But the idea is a very simple one. And it is that we need to devise a way of organizing a society that restores the the, the, the symbiotic relationship between human activity and the natural environment. Uh, it is a very basic idea, but it is an entirely, then that would be an entirely different model of the economy from the way in which we work, we think it works. Um, and that lecture, which I, uh, it goes far beyond environmental economics, it goes beyond the cost-benefit uh, methods of estimating externalities and uh, who should pay for them. It is in if you wish, a philosophic and longer view which sees the break with the Industrial Revolution, the break with that Industrial Revolution, that Industrial Capitalism, uh, that, that changed the relationship of human humans over nature from uh, to, to one of man dominating nature, but prior to that time in all regions of the world the actual levels of living were not very different uh, and basically uh, 
Na nature was uh, dominated human activity. And with that industrial capitalism, it's coming, the, it's a reversal. We begin to master nature, we harness nature, etc. And the argument now of the ecologists, and I would say that Dennis was an ecologist as well as an economist, uh, is that the, the, the uh, the planet is limited in its ability not only uh, of resources that are um, exhaustible, but particularly of the ability to absorb the, all the waste, the waste. And the figures are, and the data, it's all out there. The fact is that basically very little is being done about the climate change, about the um, about the, lo the, the loss of forests, about the loss of fish, about the reduction of um, all animals actually, about the loss of biodiversity and all of that. We have heard that, but basically the, the ma major, it's so called the uh, industrial, so called developed countries just go on doing what they were doing um, without without actually taking effective action. Uh, and this, um, I'd, I'd like, I'd like uh, to come to the close of this talk by speculating, you see, if only if Dennis had not left us, if he could have lived in our profession for the next 20 years. I believe that this vision we had, that this idea of the, of the possibility that these same islands, this Caribbean that um, 500 years ago um, was so important in the birth of capitalism, industrial capitalism in Europe, we know that is a well-known well -known, uh, story, um, could become, as we move into a, another crisis, I think crisis, we are, we are in moving into a world of very profound crisis. When I heard uh, it said, that there is a view here that uh, the, the, the way to go and the action is in uh, business and finance. I, I'm sorry, I have to tell you that that is out of date. That is, that is a view that is, that is very rapidly coming to, to be rejected and by an increasing number of even of, even of economists even of economy, um, because the um, financial crisis, when Dennis spoke about um, economics in the age of, of the meltdown, it was in uh, 2008, October, just after the crisis broke, has revealed that what we have now in the heartlands of capitalism, Europe, uh, North America, uh, is a secular stagnation, is a um, situation of very slow growth or no growth. Uh, even the future of the European Union is by no means yet assured of the unresolved problems. And at the heart of that problem, at the heart of that problem has been the capture of governments by, the, by uh, finance. What has been called a silent coup, it's <laughs> been called uh, similar things, but governments of the United States, of Europe, of Britain, have really been unable to deal with all the causes of that financial crisis because the, the um, because it is a case of capture. Now when the crisis hit and I was following 
from IMF statistics, one of the most noticeable aspects revealed in 2009 and 2010 first was that it hit hardest in the, in, in the centers, the central countries, and the IMF um, had constantly revised their figures downward, that the developing world by and large recovered very quickly, and was in the case of all of developing Asia, really was hardly affected. But the regions of the world, which were of the developing world, which were most severely affected by the crisis, were exclusively what I call the southern periphery of the United States, Mexico, Central American countries, and all the Caribbean countries were deeply negative. All of them required IMF programs, unlike any other countries of Latin America. In all of Africa, only very, very six billion dollars, I think, in total were dispersed in all the 30 countries of Africa as a result of that crisis, which was really had more to do with the food, with the rising food prices of 2008. Um, so we, we have a situation here where it was precisely those countries that were most closely integrated with the North, with the United States, and that includes Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean that were hit the hardest, uh, that had to go to the IMF for more IMF programs. Um, and the analysis which were done, including by some very good papers written by fund staff members, concluded that the crisis hit hardest precisely those countries which were most closely financially connected. And speaking of that, when I say I think that this fascination with finance is a thing of the past, I am um, I was very distressed for a long time to discover that so many bright young students in economics were looking, uh, were looking for employment in, with the banks, with the financial sector. I think that that fascination is pretty well over, and if it isn't, it should be. Um, and that serious people are considering that economics profession seriously failed in that crisis that broke since 2008, and that the world truly is faced by very serious problems of which the climate change is perhaps at the top of the list. Um, when Dennis felt that that the tipping point of the ecological crisis was more serious than the financial crisis. He had a, he had a point, a, a good point. So I would just like to conclude. I hope I haven't gone on too long. I hope I haven't bored you. But I would like to leave you here with the thought that our colleague and our friend, Dennis Pantin, is a, was a path-breaking economist of great importance. And I, I have to say, hope you will forgive me, that sometimes, particularly in this country, in Trinidad, memory is too short. We don't, we don't treasure, recognize, remember maybe too well people that have contributed so much uh, and uh, I just hope that this is indeed the first lecture in the series and we will have many more and that I'll be able to come and sit in the audience and enjoy listening to somebody instead of having to be up.
Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I think Professor Levitt outdid herself in terms of her, her inaugural lecture on Dennis Panton's behalf.